Good morning. It is a pleasure and an honor to be here today giving this lecture on advances in global ophthalmology. I want to thank Dr. Alfonso for this invitation. Let me tell you some few things about my professional life. I started my career as a resident at the Hospital Italiano of Buenos Aires in 1976 and became the head of the eye department in 2004. I made my living as a cataract and refractive surgeon, but my passion was always teaching. Initially, training residents and as a speaker in courses and symposiums nationally and internationally until 2014, when I started focusing all my teaching activity on training faculty. My goal today is to share with you the work I have done and the rewards and challenges I have found in global ophthalmology when developing and running faculty training programs around the world. I will divide my talk in different segments. First, I will cover global ophthalmology and the relation, what we do has to do with it, the importance of faculty training, my roadmap, or better said, the roadmap I followed with the team I'm part of, the organizations we have worked with, the people we have worked in these organizations, the programs we developed, and the rewards and challenges we have found and still find when training teachers around the world. So let's start talking a little bit about global ophthalmology. In general, global ophthalmology is defined as international efforts to fight and eliminate needless blinders in the world. These efforts to decrease blindness started as surgical expeditions to countries that had not enough surgeons and enormous backlogs in cataract surgery, and because of this, thousands of blind people in their population. Surgeons from other countries traveled to perform hundreds of surgeries and then flew back to their countries. Of course, this was not sustainable enough to eliminate this unnecessary in the words of Jeff Petty, the boss word today for global ophthalmology is to help build capacity in the countries that have the mentioned backlog. There are many examples of organizations that are today helping to build this capacity. At the Global Reach area of the American Academy uh, website, you can find a very comprehensive list. I will be mentioning only some of them as examples on how they help to build capacity. The ones I mentioned are the ones that in one way or another I have been involved with. The following list of activities does not imply that all of these organizations cover the same areas, but many areas are common to all. The two organizations with which I have worked most are the International Council of Ophthalmology and the Ophthalmology Foundation. But I also have developed work with SIVA, Orbis, and with uh, the area of education in server side. The examples that are following are from the Aravind Eye Care System, which I believe are great examples on how capacity is built. Great examples of building capacity are the hospitals that the Aravind Eye Care System has built, both secondary and tertiary hospitals. In places that are far from these hospitals, they extend the reach of quality eye care to the poor and the needy through active community involvement of screening camps, both on comprehensive ophthalmology and diabetic retinopathy screening. Today, tail ophthalmology is a great tool to give support in places where you cannot find specialists in diabetic retinopathy and premature retinopathy. Another good example of creating capacity is the flying plane of Orbis, where they do not only perform surgeries, but also they train surgeons to perform these surgeries. And finally, I get to the example of what we do to build capacity. And this is faculty training. 
whether online or face to face, we help teachers to teach better. Why is it important to train faculty? First, it amplifies your work. When a surgeon operates on patients, he reaches an X number of E's that get the benefit from the surgery. If the surgeons train other surgeons, this is extended. But when you train faculty, this extends your reach to many more patients that need it. Why does impact increase when you train the trainers? Because teaching does not equal learning. Most teachers focus on the transference of knowledge, whether on face-to-face -face teaching or teaching through uh, webinars. Usually teachers speak, learners listen. But this focus only on the transference phase does not guarantee learning. For learning to occur, you need the processing phase where you incorporate, process, store, and luckily then retrieve and apply what you have learned. We need to train teachers to use the flipped classroom. The flipped classroom is when we invert what usually happens. In the traditional way, the teacher gives the lectures and then sends students to do their homework, math, or essays, and here is where they get into trouble and where they need the teacher more. That is why flipping the classroom means that all the lecturing, the students get it from watching recorded videos, and then they use teacher time to solve the problems, with the teacher there to help them. You may say, but residents, we don't give homework to residents. No, it's worse. We give them lectures and then we expect them to go and apply what they've learned in real life patients. The other thing teachers usually do not use as they should is interactivity during their classes. Why is it important? Why do we need it? Asking questions to the audience immediately triggers evoking previous knowledge. Whether they answer correctly or no, this action will have impact on the learning. First of all, you will be able to determine the knowledge on the topic at hand and will allow you to adjust your content and pace. It will allow them to identify false assumptions and remediate them. The results of this can also generate more discussions in class. Finally, connecting new knowledge to old one is a very important process to store new knowledge in long-term memory in a way that it will be easy to evoke it and bring back to working memory when you need it. Small group teaching is another strategy that usually teachers do not use enough. In small group teaching, students work together. They interact and try to achieve common goals. And here the teacher only acts as a facilitator. Another thing teachers usually do not do is help fighting the forgetting curve. As you know, when you finish a course or reading a book, what you have learned is maximum at the end of it. But as you go back to work, especially if you do not apply what you have learned, all this learning starts slowly to fade away. And when after some time you get a patient or you have to apply this, the knowledge is not there. So we need to develop instruments that will help to fight this forgetting curve. Usually we do this with performance support documents. And an excellent tool to develop these performance support documents is a mind map software. I do not have time, of course, to go into detail on this now. Finally, I want to give a last example on why training teachers is necessary. When I visit many residency training programs and I go to the operating room, I still see instructors 
that left the resident to the surgery until he has a complication. And then is when they change places and the attending uh, faculty finishes the surgery. What we must remember is that the main goal of instructors is to prevent complications and not fix them. On the other hand, I also see surgeons that because they are afraid that the residents will have a complication, they let them do little or nothing during the surgery. There are many techniques and strategies to let your uh, residents do different parts of the surgery and still keep it safe for the patient. Let me tell you now uh, a little bit about my roadmap, how I got involved in uh, training the trainers and uh, what my roadmap was. My involvement in global ophthalmology uh, started in 2007 when a residency program director's course was held in Buenos Aires by the International Council of Ophthalmology. This program was initially developed by Cargonic and Andy Lee and uh, under the name of Educating the Educators. It was in 2003 where they started with this. Sometime later, they incorporated into the AUPO meeting. It was after this that Bradley Strapsma contacted Carl Gornick and Andy Lee and asked them to make this program international. And this is how the first program residency director's course was held in Mexico and then in Buenos Aires. From there on, under the guidance and support of Bruce Pivey, all of us started going around the world running these residency programs director's courses. I will tell you now a little bit about the organizations I, or better we, because really this is the history of a team. The organizations we work with. As I said before, all this work started in 2007 with International Council of Ophthalmology when and while Bruce Bybee was president and then Hugh Taylor. We worked several years with the International Council until in 2019 the new leadership of the ICO decided to stop focusing on training the trainers. And our work was cut. Luckily, at that time, David Pyatt, James Maso, and Bruce Pivey had already had worked uh, getting funding for all this teaching for the ICO and seeing that uh, the work we had been doing was cut, decided to create a new foundation called the Ophthalmology Foundation and our work kept on going on ininterruptedly. So our main organization now is the Ophthalmology Foundation, but we also have done and keep on doing work with the Pan American Association of Ophthalmology, with the SIVA and with Orvis and its teaching branch, CyberSight. So let's now take a look at the people we work with. All the work I will describe in a moment was done with the help of more than 465 volunteers from 69 countries from all around the world. Our core team is led by Dr. Carl Gornick and conformed by Dr. Gabriela Palis Dr. Elena Felipe and myself. But I need to mention also Andrew Lee that uh, has uh, left our group some years back from now, but whose work at the beginning was very important to start setting up most of the programs we are still running today. And of course, from the beginning and still now, we have Dr. Bruce Pivey, that uh, is our mentor, our inspiration, 
and our support. A team like this one would not be able to work efficiently and effectively without the help of our staff, Christine Graham, Ashley Elliott, and Cordula Gabriel Overmeyer. I also do not want to forget our past ICO staff, William Felch, our CEO, Kathy Miller, our Executive Director, Christine Graham, our Education Coordinator, and Lindsay Washington, our Chief Operating Officer. Thank you all for all your work. So let us now take a look at our programs. First, our residency program director's courses. These are two days training workshops where before going to the residency program and visiting the country, we send them a needs assessment so that we can focus uh, the topics we will be talking about and discussing on really their needs. We send them more than 60 topics from a curriculum from where they can choose what they feel will be more important for them at that time. The program is divided into five big sections that uh, include teaching principles, teaching methods, technology assisted teaching and learning, curriculum development and assessment principles, methods and tools. Probably the two most popular topics usually chosen are teaching in the operating room and teaching in the clinic. During all these years, we have run nearly close to 30 program directors in different cities and different countries all around the world. The second activity I want to mention is the conference for educators that are one day workshops the day before, big meetings such as the Asia Pacific, the Pan American Association of Ophthalmology meeting, the American Academy meeting, the European Society of Ophthalmology meeting, and the MEACO meeting. Uh, during this day, we have short lectures and a lot of small group discussions. At least we have run uh, 17 uh, conferences for educators around the world in different cities, sometimes going back to the same city because meetings many times take place in different years in the same city. The other area we work on is on developing work-based assessments, the rubrics, that are tools to, to prove competency and that allow providing detailed feedback to the learner on their performance during surgery. Starting with the ICO and now continuing with the ophthalmology foundation, we have developed uh, many rubrics, more than those you can see here in this slide. They are called the ophthalmology surgical competency assessment rubrics are known by their acronym, the OSCARS. Until now, we have 15 that are published and three more in progress. These rubrics are developed by uh, a panel of experts on the surgery. And when finished, it is sent to a bigger group of experts to validate what the initial group did. These are all available in, uh, for free in the website of the Ophthalmology Foundation. Surgical procedures are broken down into individual steps that you can see on the left side of the rubric and each step is graded on a scale of novice, beginner, advanced beginner and competent that you can find at the top. For this, you need to look at the content inside the description of the performance to achieve each grade. The assessor circles the observed performance description at each procedure step. All Oscars should be completed at the end of the case and immediately discussed with the student to provide timely, structured and specific performance feedback. 
We arrive now to our website where among other resources you will be able to find our most important course that is the teaching skills series. Access to this course and all content is free but you must register first. This course is conformed now by around 50 models uh, and each month we launch a new one. Uh, this course is planned uh, so that you can start at any time and with any model. Each model is a closed area of content with its own certificate. Uh, each time you complete uh, a model, you get a, certi a CME certificate given by the University of Cincinnati. When you enter each uh, model, you will be able to see the goal and objectives for that model and find all the resources that are in it. Usually, each model has uh, several narrated presentations, mind maps, question and answer forums, uh, some have application exercises, a quiz, and uh, a form to evaluate the, the model. This evaluation is done by the participants. All models are developed by different speakers. Once you arrive at the area where lectures are, you will see the title of the lectures, the name of the author, and the time each lecture takes. Once uh, you choose the lecture you want to watch, the lecture will open in a new window and at the bottom of the lecture you will see the controls you have over the lecture while watching. The common controls are the stop and pause button, the rewind and forward buttons, the volume and the time that the lecture has been rolling up and how much is uh, still to finish. But one of the most important uh, options inside this menu is the table of contents. This table of contents will allow you to jump to any part of the lecture and this is very important when once you have seen the lecture once you want to go back to review a different part of it. So this allows you to jump freely from one section to another. The other important thing is the control you have over the speed of the lecture. This allows that those who know a lot about the topic and just want to skim through it can put the speed uh, at a faster pace. But those who uh, have difficulty understanding or new to the lecture or where English is not their first language, they can make it go slower to better understand what the speaker is saying. In the next section, you get to see uh, the mind maps. For each lecture, we set up a mind map. This mind map is seen as uh, branches of a main stem where all the important topics of the lecture are put in as a question. So these maps uh, uh, work uh, in two ways. First, it helps uh, as self-assessment. The learner reads the question and gets to know if he knows the answer or not. If he doesn't know the answer, he can click on the end of the branch and then the answers will appear, usually in a form of a slides. That can be uh, put into full screen view. The other way this uh, helps is because these mind maps work as performance support documents. They are easily accessible from a phone and if in the future 
during work, uh, some learner needs to review a topic he knows he has seen, he can come here to uh, the mind maps and do so. The next sec section is the, the PDFs of the lecture with the transcription. This comes very handy once you have seen the lecture and you want to do a quick review. You can go to the PDF, go to the slide uh, where the topic of your interest is, and you can go through the transcript, uh, reading it much faster than it would take to listen to this part of the lecture again. Finally, we have a part of references where we put articles of interest related with the model. We have a question and answer forum where you can ask questions to the uh, tutors. Uh, we usually have a live session after the model has been open for a month where we give feedback to uh, learners that have finished some of their work and where learners can ask more questions. And there is, at the end, um, you can get your certificate. Once you've finished uh, with a quiz and you've done the, the assessment and any other work that is required to complete the model, automatically you can uh, print your certificate. Other activities we do and that you can find in uh, our website are the mentoring programs. We have two kinds of mentoring programs, one called one-on-one, -on -one, where we match uh, mentees with mentors. There are forms that mentees and mentor can uh, fill in and uh, according with their interests, they are matched there. The other one is the mentoring program for group mentoring. This is a program that will help organizations uh, develop continuing professional development for the members. Uh, Elena Felipe is the leader of and champion of this uh, area and has worked with uh, some societies, especially in Africa, the Congolese Society of Ophthalmology and the Mozambican College of Ophthalmology. Finally, we get to the rewards and challenges we have found with all this activity. Of course, one evident reward for us is the traveling we get. If you look at all the cities we visited, two main programs, the residency program, director's courses, and the conferences for educators. Really, we have kept to known uh, countries and cities we have never uh, visited, if not for uh, being involved in this program. Also, once we get to know how our work can impact on fighting blindness, this is another reward we, we get when working with this. Another reward is meeting a lot of people. In this slide, I can only put some of the photographs of some of the people we've worked with. But remember that more than 400 volunteers have been participating with this, and we have interacted with most of them. The other reward we have is that we always learn from those who are supposed to be the learners. They are also teachers, they have their own ideas, they uh, uh, attack problems in different ways, and many times we come back with new uh, strategies to apply to our learners. The other challenge, and one of the most important ones we have, is how to measure really the impact we have. The Kilpatrick evaluation model is something we use 
and then can help us measuring this. The lower the level, the easier it is to measure it. For example, the reaction, if participants liked what they participated in, is very easy. You just do a poll. The learning, did the learning transfer? This is also easy because you use an exam, a quiz, exercises, and you can uh, decide on that if really they have learned. The impact. Did the training change behavior? Well, this is where difficulty starts because in our cases, when we train trainers, this has to be assessed really by the organization in which uh, they work. Has the training changed their behavior? Are they teaching different? And the fourth level, results, did the training influence performance? This is also that needs to be assessed in the organization they belong to. Of course, all these assessments, even they have to be done there, uh, you can work with the organization to help them set them up. But I would add, there are more things to add to the Kilpatrick evaluation model things that are important to measure the impact. For example, does the training keep on going? Because many times we uh, work with an organization that starts this training for their uh, doctors, goes on for some time, but then disappears. And finally, the question, most important question probably, is with all this, are we helping blindness numbers go down? Well, this is probably the uh, most difficult uh, question to answer, and really we haven't found a solution for this. Another challenge we are passing now through is that we have too many things to do. As I showed you, we are a small group that leads all the activities we develop, and many times I feel like a one-man orchestra. Probably Gabby and Elena also feel the same. This is why it is important to expand leadership. This is not easy. Probably there are many people out there uh, that can uh, help us and even replace us. But the thing is that we do not take the time and the effort to try to get them on board. After uh, expanding leadership, the next step is planning succession. We will not last forever and we need to plan for succession. Uh, it is important that after you expand leadership, you start slowly stepping aside and leave the new leaders to take the reins while you can still mentor them. The final challenge I see is balancing face-to-face -face with virtuality. The first thing we did when the world was open for travel again is to celebrate. But we must realize that virtual training can reach much more people with the same effort. It's more cost-effective and it's recyclable. This means that if you give a face-to-face -face lecture, once it's over, it's finished. Nobody can benefit from it again unless you give it again. But if your presentation is online with no effort from your side, it can be continue being seen by many, many learners. So my take-home message would be if you teach and enjoy teaching, find ways to become a better teacher. Remember that teaching does not necessarily mean learning for your learners. Help your residents to become better teachers from the beginning. This can be done with little or no effort from your side. There are many online, well-structured resources to help anybody become a better teacher.
If you are involved in any way in global ophthalmology, remember that training faculty is another way of building capacity. If you do not have the resources for doing this, remember there are many organizations that you can partner with for training the trainers. So thank you very much to all of you for your attention today.